Hello and welcome to the first episode of season three of the Work Well podcast. It's great to be back after what was a really nice break and I'm really excited for the guests and the conversations that I'm already lining up for this season. Delighted to welcome the Fruit People as our brand new partner for season three. The Fruit People are leading the way in workplace nutrition, both in office and remotely. Check out thefruitpeople.ie for more on their offering. And it's with thanks to the Fruit People, we have a delicious fresh fruit and healthy snack pack to give away to one lucky listener for each episode of season three, including this one. To find out how to enter, go to workwellpodcast.com and find the link to this episode. Now, to our guest for today, a great pleasure to welcome Dermot Whelan to the show to kick off season three. Dermot is a radio and TV presenter, a public speaker. He's a certified Masters of Wisdom and Meditation teacher and a stand-up comedian. He's perhaps best known for co-presenting the hugely popular Dermot and Dave show on Today FM. But as you'll hear through the course of our conversation, he's had such a varied and interesting career and that continues today with the well-being work he's doing in addition to his radio work. Before this conversation, now I have to be honest, I looked at stress and Westlife as two completely separate things. Having spoken with Dermot, I now find that they are inextricably linked and you will too after listening to this episode. Sit back and enjoy my chat with Dermot Whelan. Dermot, hello and welcome to the Work Well podcast. Hello, Brian. It's a pleasure to be on the Work Well podcast. It's a real pleasure to have you here. And first question and most important question, how are you? I'm doing well. I'm one of the lucky people who have been able to leave their house every day at the same time I used to pre-COVID and come into uh, my usual radio studio at Today FM. That's kind of my bread and butter job. Um, So I consider myself very fortunate that I'm able to do that. So I've had a sense of routine for quite some time. Um, My wife would feel differently about her setup. And, you know, I'm sure a lot of your listeners uh, and viewers are, are definitely feeling that way as well, you know. Routine is so important, absolutely. Um, so you, you touched on the kind of the, the radio stuff, but following your career there, I can see you followed that, that really well-worn career path of archaeology and French graduate to film, to radio, to TV presenter, comedian, meditation teacher, and soon to be author. Uh, you know, but maybe by way of introducing yourself and maybe those that don't know you, Tell us a little bit about that career progression, because I do love, uh, you know, a career path that's that's outside the norm. <laughs> a path is probably a bit a bit of a stretch. It's more of like some kind of a a bizarre trail through a forest. But um, yeah, it, it's it was. I suppose I've always been interested in media, and I've always been interested in ancient history. So as a kid, I was obsessed with. Um, you know, ancient Egypt and ancient Greece and Rome. Um, But I was also making my own comedy sketches and radio shows in my bedroom. So uh, I I remember I saw Indiana Jones, the Raiders of the Lost Ark when I was 11. And I thought, this is what I want to do. Little did I realize, like, Indiana Jones is the worst archaeologist ever. Like, (laughs) he would be fired from any archaeological society that he was a part of. Like... He comes in, absolutely trashes a place, takes no notes, like destroys everything, steals the uh, the things he finds, the treasures. And as soon as he leaves an ancient uh, site, the whole thing tends to collapse in on itself. <laughs> so, um, no, he's a terrible archaeologist. And, and I quickly discovered that archaeology isn't like Indiana Jones, that um, particularly if you're going to do Irish archaeology, it's less sort of Egyptian temple and more off the side of a motorway, um, you know, digging in the wet ground before they build a petrol station. So it's far less glamorous. Uh, So 
I, I think my degree was probably enough of archaeology for me at that point. And, and then I kind of wandered into, into film and TV, kind of working behind the scenes as an assistant director, which basically means I made cups of tea for actors. That seems to be most of my job. And uh, I shouted, rolling, every time uh, they started to, <laughs> to actually uh, film something. So uh, I think then at, at sort of my late 20s, I'd always had a, a grow for radio. I was always fascinated with it. I thought it was a very, it seemed to be a very creative medium because you couldn't really because you couldn't see, you create the pictures in your own mind. And that's, that's probably the most creative we can get is with our own imagination. So that's when I sort of drifted into radio uh, and I started off in news, knowing nothing about news, but I just did a really good impression of a newsreader. I could go like, it's one o'clock and here are the headlines. But I didn't really know what I was meant to be doing. I knew nothing about politics. So I was a bit of a bluffer, really. Um, and then I kind of got into stand-up comedy from that because I used to make comedy sketches in the newsroom after hours just to amuse myself. And one of the other radio shows um, managed to hear one or two of them and I, I kind of got my break uh, that way. And then I started doing stand-up comedy. So w weirdly, it was the stand-up comedy that led me into the meditation business because of the sheer stress attached to that and everything else that I was doing at the time back in the early noughties. So um I had a panic attack on the way to a comedy festival um, because I was just, I was sleep deprived and doing breakfast radio and I was doing comedy at nighttime and television and I had small kids at home. So I was definitely a victim of burnout. Uh, so I can empathize with anyone who's ever felt overwhelmed from work as uh, you know, a lot of people at the moment are jumping from Zoom call to Zoom call. So that was kind of the incident that led me then down into a more of a wellness path. And a wellness path sounds very grandiose, but to be honest, I just needed to find something that would ha help me manage stress better than a pint of Guinness. So meditation opened that door for me and I found it was far healthier and way cheaper. <laughs> and... I, I actually, I heard you speak on another podcast kind of about that, about the panic attack and about, and you, had a, you had an interesting line where you said that alcohol was the only stress management technique or tool that you were aware of at the time. So you, you really changed your focus from, from that to, to meditation. And that's, that was really the door that opened for you, meditation to you. Yeah, totally. I mean, I, I do feel that particularly in Ireland, you know, when you're growing up, really the only stress management I had ever seen demonstrated to me by the adults around me uh, was alcohol, you know, or nicotine or maybe sugar, you know. And I think for many of us, that's kind of, you know, we're not, they're not, yeah, you're not walking around saying, now kids, I'm managing my stress, but it's all, it's all done by, you know, example and, and our actions, you know. So, we would see the grown-ups in our lives opening a bottle of wine on a Friday and going, ah, you know, or going to the pub and having a pint and going, ah. And that seems to be stress relief or stress management of some sort. And we kind of pick up on those things when we're younger. So, you know, it, it, schools are so much better now in terms of dealing with issues like mindfulness and meditation and uh, just aspects of, of managing stress and looking after your mental well-being. But, you know, for up until even five years ago, there was pretty much nothing in school teaching us how to navigate all the challenges that we have. So as an adult, I suppose I was no different to most other people in that I didn't really have anything in, you know, my emotional toolbox that I could reach for that I do now and that I rely on very heavily because I'm still busy and I still like being busy. Um, so, you know, for many people, yeah, that's what I try and, and bring to my teaching is just make it really accessible, really straightforward. Here's a few techniques you can use so that you don't hit crisis point down the line where, like me, you're having a panic attack on the side of the road outside Kilkenny beside a roundabout. It's not as glamorous as it sounds, <laughs> you know, so that's why it's really important to me to... Uh, bust a lot of myths around meditation, make it as fun and accessible for people as possible. Because, you know, just because we work in the corporate uh, world, or, you know, my, even though I work in the radio, it's still a very corporate setting. You know, I'm here in an office and we have usually have sales teams and marketing teams and, you know, management and accountants and all the things that a normal company has. So uh, there just happens to be a radio studio in the corner. Um, 
But, you know, just because we work in a corporate environment doesn't mean that we necessarily need every bit of information delivered to us in a very corporate style. Um, you know, very formally, I, I think that our minds are funny, they're weird and they're unpredictable. Um, and, you know, we're, we're human beings, whether we have a, a shirt and tie on or our smart work clothes or whether we're sitting in shorts and a T-shirt, we're all human. So I think if we if I can deliver any helpful meditation or wellness techniques uh, in the most accessible and fun way, then I, I think I've more chance of people actually engaging with it. I think that's, it sounds like a great approach because you know, meditation and mindfulness, there can be a barrier to, for, for quite a few people, you know, myself included, you know, I don't want to kind of start that or, or where do I start? So I love kind of the, the approach you're coming at, um, you know, the way you say it's kind of like you're, you're myth busting as you go. And, you know, it's, it's a mix. It's kind of a mix. So it's fun. It's fun. There's the meditation in there. Tell us a little bit of how that works exactly. You know, immediately I'm thinking it's, it's a little bit of meditation. There's a few laughs, then there's some meditation. H how does it actually work when you put the two of them together? Um, well, first of all, it's sort of my rule is to not take it or myself too seriously. You know, and I do think in the meditation slash spiritual world, you know, the kind of stuff you see on Instagram and the like, it can take itself very seriously, you know, and it's almost as if it's, it's an exclusive club that, you know, people on the poor paupers on the outside are just will never know about, you know, and I like to poke fun at the whole world of it, you know, and I think that puts people at ease because I like me, I had preconceptions about meditation and the whole thing. When I started, I thought it was sounded a bit culty, a bit, what was it religious or did I have to change my behavior? Um, would I suddenly become no crack? You know, that's another <laughs> worry that a lot of people have. You know, am I going to just take myself seriously and, and just have no crack and never be able to have a pint again? Like, no, not at all. It's you're going to be enhancing all the good parts of you, the good crack parts of you, but maybe turning the volume down on, on, on the more destructive or unhelpful parts of your personality. So, um, so I suppose I like to poke fun. You know, when I see pictures online of so-called meditators in in the lotus position usually t a shot taken from behind and they're always wearing white clothes like white flowy linen and it's somewhere beautiful like a wooden jetty or a mountain top you know and i like to show those slides and those pictures in my presentations because like I, it just makes me laugh those things because it's just not real and that's the stuff that puts people off yeah. you know that person in the photo is not meditating they're waiting for for their boyfriend to take the picture behind them on their iPhone so they can <laughs> upload it to Instagram. They're not at one with everything. Like the guy on the mountaintop, all he's getting from that experience is a really sore behind. That's it. You know, it's way <laughs> easier just to take a few minutes of stillness on your favorite chair or sitting up in bed or at your desk. You know, we don't have to suddenly become Instagram people to connect or, or get the benefits of this whole thing. So, um, you know, there are serious aspects of it, I suppose, you know, there's lots of science behind it. And I, I love exploring the science and sharing that science with people, particularly over the last 10 years. Um, so much has come out about the positive impact and the benefits of introducing a regular meditation practice, you know. So, you know, and some of the science can be funny. I, I, I talk about one study that aims to reassure people that it's okay not to to be okay with sitting alone with your thoughts. I mean, it's foreign to a lot of us. We're, we're out of the habit of it since we were kids. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, it's not usual to just sit by yourself. So, you know, and a lot of people are uncomfortable with that. So for instance, I like to talk about a scientific study that was done in the University of Virginia, where they asked participants to sit in a room for 15 minutes with no distractions, hardly any furniture, no phones. And that was it, that's all they said. But they put, a button on the table in front of them, um, which was hooked up to a battery. And they said, look, you don't have to press that button, no pressure, but if you want to during the 15 minutes, it will give you a painful electric shock. And so they went, okay. And like to their shock and surprise, they saw that 67% of men chose to electrocute themselves <laughs> rather than sit in silence with their own thoughts. Now, the women were marginally better at 25%, but still, it's a shocking indictment of our ability to sit with ourselves. But, you know, we can get better with it. We can get better at it with a little bit of practice. It doesn't take much, but I like to bring in those kinds of 
humorous and, and sort of uh, interesting, engaging scientific studies that reassure people that, you know, we're not all monks, you know, we're not all uh, Mr. Miyagi from The Karate Kid, you know, we're, we're, you know, our brains are bouncing around like puppies. So any bit of training that we can do goes a long way and has quite a, a large ripple effect uh, into our life. And that includes how we approach our jobs and how motivated we feel with our jobs, how much passion we have for our jobs. Um, and of course, with all the things that surround our lives outside our jobs in terms of our family and the people that we love. I can, I can really relate to that story about the button. I certainly, I would have pushed that button, no question. I, I thought you were going to say, actually, it had a, just a you know, do not touch sign on the button and I, I would have pushed it straight away. But uh, for, for, for people that are struggling to, to get started, say, um, you, you speak about how, you know, how easy it is to get started. And I've heard you speak before, but there's a very simple 16 second meditation you can you can use is, is that kind of the best way to get started just to literally you know take 16 seconds out of your day you know it doesn't take an hour it doesn't take a couple of days worth of training it can be as simple as a 16 second meditation completely brian yeah i mean one of the main um one of the main stumbling blocks for people is time you know and one of the excuses that we use including myself i might add uh, is that I don't have the time. I would love to do meditation, but I don't have the time. Um, and that's understandable because people are loath to go, oh God, am I going to have to, I can barely get to the gym. Or I can barely get out for a walk at the moment. Mm -hmm. you're, you're asking me to take on this new practice that I got to build in every day because the science says it works if I do it every day. And immediately you're thinking, it's going to have to be an hour in the morning. And I'm going to have to sign up to something online and blah, blah. And, and I suppose, the 16 second meditation is a wonderful example and uh, um, excuse buster. So you go, well, do you have 16 seconds in your day? Most people go, yeah, yeah, I kind of do. Okay, well, <laughs> let's start there, okay? And I guarantee you, when you try it for a while, you will want to lengthen it out. And you'll just start to get curious. And I, I really ask people to get curious with it. You know, don't see it as something that they have to take on or commit to. Just get curious and and maybe uh, get curious enough to try it for a week or so and see how you get on. So the 16 second meditation was a meditation that was taught to me by my teacher. Uh, I trained in California with a chap called David G and he's one of the leading corporate stress management experts in the States. Um, and it's a technique that he coined. It's a phrase that he coined called the 16 second meditation. It's also called square breathing or square breath uh, or box breathing. So the idea is very simply is that you're, you're watching your breath go in for four seconds, then you're holding it in for four, then you're letting the breath go for four, and then you hold the breath out for four. And that's your, your 16 second meditation. Um, and often it's just enough, it certainly was for me, it was simple and, and clear enough that it gets people over the hurdle of the world of meditation. You can get them through the threshold because you go, okay, 16 seconds, I get that, that's it, there's no crystal, there's no incense all i had to do was watch my breath for 16 seconds okay you got me what's next and then you can start to open up the world of guided meditations or um you know the uh, different techniques that you can that you can teach in terms of it's a bit like music you can you can try little bits and see what resonates with you excellent yeah and it sounds you know so easy to get started um and it, it's a nice way, just a gateway, if you like, into to trying it, to get curious, as you said. I really like that line. What, what does your own uh, routine, we spoke about routine at the beginning there, that the, your own routine hasn't really changed, kind of work-wise anyway. So where does, where does meditation fit within your own routine? I would always do it in the morning. Um, basically, I follow an RPM and and raw. So RPM is rise P meditate. So <laughs> the idea is that we build it into our morning routine. We're creatures of habit. Mm -hmm. And excuse me, particularly in the morning time, if you know, you look at, at what you do in the morning, we tend to do things in the same order every single day. We will get up and we'll have our shower and we'll make our cup of coffee and you know, we'll check the same websites and we'll open the same email. So if we can build something like a meditation practice, even if it is just 16 seconds, if we can build it into that morning routine, we're far more likely 
to continue it and make it a practice because for most people, and I'm sure there's a lot of people listening to us right now, um, they might see themselves or consider themselves as crisis meditators. Um, and certainly that's what I was for a long time. And it was, you know, talking about meditation, not really doing it every day. And then as soon as something went wrong or we had a bit of added pressure or a challenge in our lives, suddenly you're, ah, you're breathing to beat the band, you know. <laughs> but as much as that doesn't work for fitness where you think, oh, uh, you know, I've got a wedding coming up and I want to look my best. So I'm going to crush it in the gym for two days this week and I'll be suddenly ripped it doesn't work for our you know the big muscle in our skulls either so um a little bit every day goes a goes a very long way so that's what i try and do and we can build it into our morning routine um it means that we don't have to think about it you know even by the time we open up our laptop and click on our first meeting or open our first email we've already banked that little bit of self-care for ourselves raw is right after work r-a-w right after work and that is a nice way of sort of bookending the really mentally active part of your day. So when you leave the office in normal times and, and get home or whether it's just closing your laptop in the box room or wherever you happen to be at the moment. And that's just taking a few minutes or even a few seconds just to introduce another meditation, another opportunity to, I see it as a kind of a psychological shower, you know, that you're, you're sort of, cleansing all the crap that you picked up throughout the day you know on, on a conscious or unconscious level so for me it means that I know particularly if I'm a little bit wound up or a bit stressed maybe I've just you know gone from meeting to meeting to meeting and I'm feeling that kind of tired but wired feeling it's a really nice opportunity to take that and then I know that after the 15 or 20 minutes or however long I, I sit down for when I face my lovely wife and kids that hopefully I'm bringing a better more patient version of myself into that part of our day you know because I feel for a lot of people you know we can manage to keep it together quite well in a work setting and then but if we're finding things are stressing us out consciously or unconsciously sometimes we can bring that into the next phase of our day and that's the home part and I know there's a lot of people who talk to me like oh I just, I'm, I'm really irritable. I'm short tempered around, you know, my husband or my wife and my kids in the evening, particularly around bedtime when it's a bit hectic. Um, and I just wish I could find a bit more peace and calm at that time of the day. So at work almost they're, you know, they're being, they're keeping, they're on it, you know, their, their work hat is well and truly on, but it's just that navigating into the home thing where you're tired you know, there's lots going on. You're suddenly putting on the parental hat. That can be a testing time for people. So, and sometimes if we are a bit short-tempered or tempered or, or snapping at the people that we care about the most, which we tend to do because we're so familiar with them, that can lead to a lot of feelings of guilt or shame, you know, that you're like, oh, you know, why am I this? I can hear myself saying these narky things and I don't want that to be me, you know? So sometimes that after work few moments that you can take, can be massively beneficial for your sense of well-being outside of work. I, I love that, especially the the raw part. That's probably the first time I've heard something like that. You know, the the after work piece. Because a, a lot of the the feedback I'm getting through the community and from the listeners is they're really struggling with that switching off, especially if they're where they're working from home at the moment. That piece where their the laptop is in the living room or the bedroom or in the kitchen. And it's, it's, it's there constantly and they're just walking to another room and effectively they're supposed to switch off, if you like, from being working mom or dad to, to just mom or dad. And so I think that definite pause, that definite break that you're talking about, that sounds like a really nice technique to introduce into the day. Yeah, it is. And, and particularly, as you say, at the moment, because our work setup has changed so dramatically, you know, I hear of people who are finishing work and they're like, OK, Zoom meeting. OK, see you guys. Talk to you tomorrow. And then they're control tabbing into Netflix. And, and that's then their evening begins and they haven't even moved from the chair or got away from the laptop, you know, and that's just how people find themselves, particularly people living alone, you know, um, and young people as well who just can't can't get access to their normal social life and, and the friends and distractions that they normally have. So. Uh, it's it's more important now than ever because we don't have these natural breaks. For a lot of us, it's the commute 
you know, it's the drive in our car, even if we hate traffic, we're probably listening to an interesting podcast or listening to Today FM or um, chatting to someone on the phone on the way home. Uh, you know, there's people cycling and that, that's, that clears their head, you know, that journey from work to home. Um, there's people going for a walk or, or whatever it is. Because we don't have those normal natural breaks now, we have to artificially create them. Um, and that's what I would always be trying to encourage um, anyone uh, that I would be teaching is, is to try and introduce those couple of minutes, even if it's, um, you know, just at your laptop and you take two minutes of, of deep breathing um, and, and that's what you do. But we have to introduce those little breaks. Maybe it's uh, just a mindful walk, you know, um, what is a mindful walk? Very simply, you know, you're getting outside, you're walking, but instead of just thinking about whatever random stuff comes into your head, you're just trying to focus on sounds you can hear around you while you're walking, sounds that are near, sounds that are far away, uh, the sound of the gravel underneath your feet, and then you shift to another sense. So what can you smell in the air? Um, you know, what can you see? What's close? What detail can you see on, on flowers or trees? What can you see far away? So you're just kind of pivoting between the senses and even a five minutes of that of a mindful walk at the end of a day where you've been stuck to your laptop in you know in a bedroom or the kitchen that can be really really effective great great advice really great advice and i, I love the the mindful walk idea i'm I, I do i have these kind of fancy earbuds now as, as i know many people do and I, I do like going out for a walk you know putting in the earbuds maybe listening to a podcast or two but I, I do make a point as well of trying to mix it up with okay leave the earbuds at home today just get out for that quiet meditative walk if you like with with just 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 in the park just the, just the sounds and sights around as you mentioned so yeah absolutely and so that either the mindful walk or, or a literal you know kind of meditation at home a couple of minutes break that a definite pause between the working day and and home time yeah it is and again it doesn't have to be much you know sometimes people think oh well, I, I could do something for half an hour now i just want to switch off mm -hmm. it, it can literally be a couple of minutes you know um i mean towards the end of this uh, we can do that 16 second meditation if you like just to um, let people see just how how easy it is and they, they can try it and see if it's something that maybe would resonate with them but again it doesn't have to be a big deal you know i i got a a message from a chap who was struggling at the start of lockdown one do you remember that it was like seven yeah. years ago <laughs> um but, you know, he was struggling with stress, the stress of not working. His, his job was sort of dissolving in front of his eyes. He had two small kids and he was finding himself that he was snapping around the house and he was getting depressed, even though he was quite a happy-go-lucky person. But just all the challenges and, and, and stress that COVID brought on and is still bringing on these days. But, but, you know, and for him, the thing that he noticed where he wasn't himself was that he had stopped singing in the shower. So for him, that was a big deal, you know, and it seems kind of innocuous, but for him, I think we, we all have these little markers uh, of our personality that sort of define us as who we are. So maybe you're the person who says hello to people, uh, smiles at people on the street, or maybe you're really friendly and talkative to people in a shop, or maybe you're, you're that friend who always calls someone up and asks how they are. For him, the marker that he was feeling himself was, I sing in the shower. That's what I do. And then I know my day is going the way I wanted to go. And he noticed that over time he'd stopped singing in the shower and that was really getting into him. So he started the 16 second meditation and just thought, I'm really new to this. I'm quite cynical about it. I'll give it a go. I heard your man on the radio talking about it. So, you know, if he's a comedian and he can do it, maybe it'll work for me. So he started doing the 16 second meditation. And then two weeks later, he sent me that message saying, Hey, I'm singing in the shower again. You know, I know this sounds stupid, but, you know, this is a big deal for me. And he started to realize that he was coming back into himself again. And that meant that, yes, he was singing in the shower in the morning, but that was having a ripple effect out into the day, which meant that he was having more patience with the people around him at home. And he was feeling more optimistic about getting more work in, in, in time he did. You know, so again, it's that it only has to be something small. If that's that's where you can start, you know, start wherever you're at. If you can only do 16 seconds, then let's start there and, and see where it takes us. But again, 
stay curious and, and be willing to turn up every day for a little while just to see if you can have some impact. Really interesting. Yeah, and I'm sure we all have those markers, as you say, whether it's singing in the shower or, or, or something else. So that's definitely something for, for all of us to think about. And, and thanks for the offer. We, we'll definitely we'll finish up with that 16 second meditation. That sounds fantastic. Yeah, great. Tell me a little bit about the, the work you're doing with, with companies now. What does that look like? You go in, is it, is it, is it a one-off session you deliver? Is it kind of a series or kind of a training program? What does that look like? Uh, it's a little bit of everything, really, but I think the nature of um, COVID has been that the one-off seminar has probably been the most effective tool, you know, over the last year. Um, I have a great partnership with Leia, um, so we work, uh, you know, very closely, and I would go into a lot of the companies that they have a good relationship with. Um, and it's anything from Amazon to Google and Adobe and a lot of pharmaceuticals and the aviation industry really, you know, the, the corporate, um, you know, the nature of the business doesn't really matter in terms of what I'm bringing because every company is full of people, you know, and whether you're selling airplanes or heart stents, it doesn't really matter. You're probably still experiencing the same pressures. Um, and interestingly, and I'm sure you found this yourself and with other speakers that you've had on, it's, it doesn't also matter whether your company is struggling with sales or whether you're flat out. E each one of them brings with it its own stresses and challenges. So I've worked with companies that have, you know, obviously their, their product hasn't been as much in demand or, or has been, their sales have been affected by COVID-19. And I've worked with companies who, because of the nature of their business, have been out the door and they can't get it out the door quick enough, the, the, their product. So, but each one is experiencing the same things, you know, they're still working from home, most of them. Um, and also it's, it's important to point out that the people who are on site uh, are just as affected. And sometimes we can forget that, it, that, you know, there are particularly in manufacturing, there are people who just have to be there. They've got to be there on the manufacturing line, but all their normal colleagues and friends and routine within work, um, a lot of that has, has disappeared as well. You know, so just because you're on site doesn't necessarily insulate you from all of the pressures and strains that people off site are feeling. So I, I always think that's important to um, to approach in my my talks as well. So, yes, I do offer programs and uh, I obviously do the, the one hour talks and it's, it's definitely the one hour seminars that have probably cut through the most um, in terms of what's been going on since March 2020. Excellent. And I think it was during one of those one hour sessions, I heard you, t I heard you talk about stress and, and how stress has a, a bad reputation. How do you, you, know, you talk about good stress and bad stress. How do you help uh, people make friends with stress? Uh, that's exactly right, Brian. I, I think that stress has got a bad reputation over the years. Sometimes I compare it to Westlife, you know, that when... <laughs> <laughs> when they some people find listening to Westlife stressful uh, in itself <laughs> but you know when Westlife were out at their at the peak of their pomp uh, people a lot of people thought oh god Westlife saps I wanted anything to do with them and then they broke up and disappeared and then they came back uh, you know for a reunion tour and people were like you know what Westlife are okay they're a bit of crack in small doses you know maybe I will go <laughs> Maybe I will go to Croke Park with my girlfriend or whatever it is. So in a way, stress has been the same. And, and you know, particularly over the last 10 or 15 years, I noticed in a lot of the science around stress, perceptions have changed a lot. Um, you know, in 2007, they, they did a study in the States, um, the American Psychological Association, and they asked people what they thought about stress. And nearly half said that stress could actually be quite a positive thing, that it helps us to be resilient and reach our goals. And then seven years later in 2014, they did a similar study and they found that nearly 90% of people felt that stress was very harmful to your health. Um, and so that's already quite a big shift in terms of how we perceive stress. And it's almost as if stress is this big evil cloud that can sort of descend on us at any moment and that now we're trapped and we've got anxiety and we're freaking out um, but I try and talk about stress and, and 
educate people as to what's actually happening from a physical point of view when you are engaged with the stress response and what actually happens when we don't turn off that stress response. And that's, I suppose, to talk um, very briefly about, you know, good stress is stress that doesn't last too long, that has a start, middle and an end. And we've all experienced it. We've sat driving tests, we've done exams, uh, we've done podcasts, um, we've had projects in work, we've had deadlines, you know, and we needed the stress response for short periods of time because we know that once we, you know, the event is over, um, we feel like we've accomplished something and that's how we reach our goals, is how we hit targets, how we hit deadlines. Um, but the problem arises when that stress is allowed to go unchecked. And I think that that's happening even more at the moment because we spoke about those natural breaks. A lot of people aren't getting them. So that, you know, the cortisol and adrenal, adrenaline levels in our systems are staying quite high a lot of the time. Uh, and that is affecting our sleep. And then that has a knock-on effect. So, you know, in a nutshell, good stress is short-term stress that has actual feasible benefits and it is a very impressive physical and biological reaction in our bodies. Bad stress is long-term stress that is allowed to go unchecked. And I like to compare it to a smoke alarm. Wherever your listeners and viewers are sitting right now, I guarantee you there's a smoke alarm near them, okay? There's probably one very near your head right now. And they're amazing inventions. We need them. And we need them to work when we need them to work. They can literally save our life. But if that alarm is ringing 24-7, it'll start to wear you down. It's like when our neighbors go on holidays and we can hear the house alarm going off and we've, we saw them put the suitcases in the taxi. We know they're not coming back. <laughs> and you think, oh God, it's two in the morning. I hate those people. <laughs> you know, the, our, our internal alarm, our stress response is the same. You know, and if we don't turn that off or learn techniques how to turn it off, then it's going to start affecting us and what happens in long-term stress it becomes chronic and that's when we start to see the effects like anxiety and depression and poor sleep and low optimism and low engagement with your work and low feelings of passion towards your work and a general sense of you know it could be something extreme or it could be as you know something like feeling meh you know mm -hmm. um so i i suppose what i like to do is show people the different kinds of stress and actually get them to make friends with short-term stress, you know, because sometimes, you know, one of the symptoms uh, that our stress responses engage is, is a quickened heart heartbeat. Mm -hmm. You know, our heart is beating a bit faster and that's because it's pumping more blood around our body and getting more blood to our brain and, you know, helping us to make better decisions in the moment. You know, sometimes people can feel their heart racing before maybe a presentation or, you know, whether that's on Zoom or in person are, you know, a meeting they're about to have or a, a conversation they're about to have that they're not quite looking forward to. And sometimes you can feel the beating heart and go, oh God, oh my God, my body's taken over here. I'm losing it, you know. But actually, no, you you know, if, if I am going to do a, a performance on stage and I don't feel my heart racing, I know I'm in trouble because that's doing a job. It's pumping blood around quicker. It's going to help me to think quicker. And it means I can think four jokes ahead. Whereas if I'm really calm, um, you know, that's not going to happen and I'll be struggling. So, you know, to, to make friends with our stress response and get to know it and know what's happening in our body so that we can become masters of it and go, do you know what? You know, that was great to have that stress response during the presentation. You know, I was in the zone. I was in the flow there and that really helped. But it's now two hours after it and I'm still feeling a bit worked up. How about I introduce a technique now just to take things down again? And I, I, I like to compare it to a cockpit of an airplane, you know, where in, a, in a, one of those action films when suddenly the plane is out of control and it starts to go down and it's like... <laughs> Pull up, pull up, and all the dials are all <laughs> over the place. You know, our, our internal makeup can, you know, our mental makeup can be like that sometimes. So the techniques that I would teach and, and learning about stress allows us to, you know, when we feel that our, our dials are all over, all over the place, we can do something short and sweet that will hopefully bring everything back online and give us a little bit of balance. Some really good practical advice there. Um, lots of Lots of good information. And, you know, at a minimum, I think from now on, so I will certainly, anyway, next time I'm feeling just a little bit stressed, first thing I'm going to think about is Westlife. So at, at a minimum, <laughs> that there's, there's an improvement there already. I'm thinking already. So, so thanks, Sorry about that. Stress and Westlife. There are two terms <laughs> I never thought I would, I would put together, but it, it makes an awful lot of sense. 
<laughs> you, you have a book coming out available for pre-order, I believe. And um, it's called Mindful. So two separate words, Mindful. Um, tell us about the book and, and what, was, what was the writing process like? Was, was this a, a, a product of COVID, if you like, of lockdown and, and spare time? Or, 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 or how, did it come, how did it come about? Yeah, it really was because I was due to go on tour with a show that was basically aimed at bringing what I do in the corporate space to the general public, you know, and, and people were asking me, you know, what, can, can I get any meditation tips for you or do I have to work in a company? So I had planned to sort of mix my training in stand-up comedy and meditation and bring a, a, a different hybrid show. And I had shows booked in in the Helix and I was looking to take it down to UL and the Opera House and places like that. But of course, COVID hit and then I, I couldn't do it. So I thought, well, what's the next best, best thing? I can, it doesn't require me to go anywhere. I can write a book. And thankfully, Gill publishers uh, were kind of thinking the same thing around the time. So uh, we teamed up and I'd never written a book before. That was a, an interesting process. There's nothing more intimidating than that first day when you have a blank Word document and a flashing cursor as if it's a, you know, it's trying to say to you, OK, then go on. Let's see what you're made <laughs> of. Um, but I actually really love the process of the book and Basically, you know, it's called mindful, which is obviously a play on words, but I suppose I'm aiming it at anyone who at any time in their life has felt like their mind is full and overflowing. Because certainly for me, when I was, you know, struggling with the, what I had on my plate and, and wasn't able to sort of had no pressure release valve, I used to feel that sense of overwhelm, like my brain was literally rammed full. And if I got another email, my head was just going to roll off my shoulders. You know, I know what it's like to have terrible sleep and be watching the clock from 3 a.m. thinking, how am I going to get through the day? I, I can't sleep. Um, you know, I, I know what those feelings are like and that sense of burnout and overwhelm. So this was an opportunity for me to, to bring the world of meditation and what I had learned to a whole new audience and bring it in a way that's fun funny and accessible you know and and the third word is the most important for me it's really important to me that this stuff is accessible it's not behind some kind of spiritual paywall you know it's open to everybody um regardless of how cynical or how into all that stuff you are you know um and it's our right to know this stuff you know because as i said at the start we we weren't taught a lot of this stuff so that's the that was the the aim of the book and that's why i'm so excited for it uh, to come out on April 16th because people will actually have a, a very accessible, fun way to learn these techniques. And even if they pick up one technique or seven techniques in the book, then, you know, I'm, I'm happy. So again, it's, it's start where you're at and hopefully they'll have a laugh while they're reading it. Um, because I, I put a lot of my own story in there as well in terms of my archaeology days and my journey into radio and, and that stuff. Um, but underlying that, I suppose, was my own, um, my own path through getting to know how my own brain worked, you know, and how what things made me anxious and what things worked for me and what didn't. So um, it was a very interesting process for me and one I'm, I'm very excited about uh, when it comes out now. Great work. And it does, you're right, it does sound so accessible. I mean, even though I would be open and interested in, you know, mindfulness and meditation, the thoughts of reading a book on it just wouldn't really, wouldn't appeal to me at all. But, but you know, if it's funny, if it's interesting, some stories in there, then the way you've kind of spoken about it there it does actually sound really appealing. So I'll definitely be getting my hands on that and I look forward to, to reading that. Just, just on, on the writing process, was that the hardest part, that first day staring at the blank page? And is it a case of get that first line, that first paragraph done? And then it's, once you got that out of the way, that's, it's just, life is a lot easier. Yeah, um, and not in a cheesy way, but mm -hmm. it did have many parallels with meditation and that I, I learned quite quickly that, Worrying about how much more I had left to do was very unproductive mm -hmm. um, and that the more I could focus on just doing what was in front of me. So turning up every day, you know, and it's the same at meditation. The only bad meditation is the one that you don't turn up for. The only bad writing session is the one that you're not there at your laptop for. So even if I could just sit down, even if I wrote a hundred words, 
you know, then that was enough. And other times if I sat down and wrote 2000 words and that was enough. So it was just, I learned very quickly that it was just about turning up and trying to stay in the present moment. The minute my mind wanders off to, uh, you know, all that, that I've left to do or it wanders back into the past uh, about how little I did the previous day, then I'm not in the right space. I'm not in the right headspace for writing. So there's lots of parallels there, but I find once, once I can sit down in front of a laptop and, and just do something, uh, then that's generally enough. And, you know, the words have a habit of adding together and suddenly at the end of it, you go, oh, wow, I did a book. How did that happen? <laughs> you know? <laughs> Brilliant. Great job. Look, look forward to reading that and we'll, we'll share the links to that in, in the show notes that go along with, with the episode. Dermot, listen, you've been really generous with your time. One more question before we finish up. And I, I ask this of every guest. You've got a busy role, you know, busy life, busy home life as well. I think it's three kids, if I'm not mistaken. How are yeah. you managing to dedicate time or do you to your own well-being? Now, I know we've touched on the meditation piece. Is there anything else you're doing to look after your own well-being? Um, yeah, I definitely try and get out into nature. I find that's a big one for me. I, I can't explain the science of what happens when I go out into nature and why it's so helpful and, and nurturing for me but you know a, a good walk I happen to live uh, in a nice place that has lots of nice walks around it so you know if I can get out and do that that's one major wellness box ticked for me um, I try and get more sleep uh, that's always one that is a challenge for me um, I tend to faff around a lot in the evening in the evening time so I try and get into bed and, and try and get to sleep before 10 if I can but mm -hmm. Uh, it's hard, particularly when you have children who just never want to go to bed, as uh, many people know. Um, I do enjoy golf when it happens. And I took up skateboarding in, <laughs> in a midlife crisis mode. I call it a midlife celebration. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> at the start of lockdown, I had just happened to have bought a skateboard because it was something that I always wanted to do as a kid. I bought one for my son and I thought, God, I'd love one of them. I'll just give it a go. Um, and then lockdown happened. So I found myself suddenly working in, in a deserted city center um, with all the space to practice skateboarding without killing anyone. And I actually found it to be really beneficial. And the skateboarding aside, it's, it's any activity that, you know, reconnects us with our childhood a little bit mm -hmm. that totally takes us out of what we've been doing and thinking about for the day so you know nothing focuses the mind like trying not to fall off something so that was really you know adding that bit of extreme mindfulness for myself um and i just i i love the always love the idea of firing up new neural pathways in our brains and doing something that isn't it that is out of our automatic mode so much of our life is on automatic pilot you know um you know, 90% of our thoughts are, are just loops that, are, that have been playing before. So if any activity that we can introduce that uh, is new, but also has a sense of play, I think is massively beneficial. So I'm, I'm delighted and embarrassed to say that I still skateboard and uh, I get a real kick out of it. And I'm not doing any tricks now. I'm not like Stephen or... or uh, Tony oh, Hawk, Tony I was going to say Stephen yeah. Hawking. I don't think it was a skateboarder. Uh, Tony <laughs> Hawk, you know, uh, even though he's in his 50s, he's still doing it. I, you know, I'm in my 40s and I'm, I'm not doing any ollies or anything. I just cruise around on it and, and just let my mind uh, wander off. So I just find that kind of beneficial. So you're probably sorry you asked that question now. <laughs> not, not at all and that's there's, a, there's nothing embarrassing about that whatsoever that that sounds that, that's possibly the coolest thing i think i've ever heard is you know skateboarding it's an absolutely it's a celebration a midlife celebration and i can imagine you kind of skateboarding to work now it just it makes that you know the, you in the, the radio studio even even cooler i think you're skateboarding to and from work um <laughs> therapeutic beneficial lots of benefits absolutely love that yeah, I'm glad you think it's cool. I don't think the 10-year-olds on my street think it's very <laughs> cool <laughs> when I come rocking out. Hey, guys, mind if I join you? <laughs> <laughs> Dermot, thanks so much for your time. Will we, will we finish with that 16-second meditation? Yeah, I'd love to, love to. And hopefully uh, people will see just uh, it doesn't take much 
to um, to try and I, get into that space. I should point out now that I recently invested, uh, you know, putting my, you know, practicing what I preach. I recently invested in a, a standing desk. So I am standing here. It's not going to uh, affect me at all. Is it? It's not going to put me to sleep in this 16 seconds now. Not at all. You're <laughs> safe. <laughs> uh, it works anywhere. It's the yeah. ultimate uh, meditation to go. And I use it in queues for shops or, right. you know, if I'm uh, sitting in traffic, obviously I keep my eyes open. Uh, but, you know, anywhere you find yourself, you, where normally you might get a little bit impatient, you know, at a bus stop or a dart station or whatever, it's a nice opportunity to go, Do you know what, I'm going to fill this time. Instead of moaning about the bus being two minutes late, I'm going to fill that with a few 16 second meditation. So, Okay, wherever you are, whether you're standing or sitting, and if it's safe to do so, you can close your eyes. And what I'd love you to do is just take a nice, long, slow, deep breath in through your nose. And as you breathe in, I'd like you to imagine that the breath is going down into your belly and you can feel your belly expand as you breathe in and then fall back down as you breathe out. So just try a couple of those belly breaths as they're known. This is a technique in itself. So you breathe in through the nose, just hold that breath in your belly for a moment. And if like me, after a year of lockdown, you've no problem finding your belly and then gently let that breath go. So we're going to introduce our 16 second technique and I'll count so you needn't worry. You can just follow my instruction. So when you're ready, take a nice, long, slow, deep breath in through your nose, down into your belly. Two, three, four. Hold that breath in your belly there for another count of four. Just hold it there. Two, three, four. And gently watching that breath leave. So you're just letting the belly drop again. Watching the breath go out. Out through your nose or out through your mouth. Doesn't matter. Three, four. Now hold that breath out. Hold it out before you inhale again. Two, three, four. And now just breathing normally. And when you're ready you can gently open your eyes so that is the 16 second meditation that's square breath or uh, box breathing and it's a very very simple technique that you can use anytime anywhere very effective if you wake up in the middle of the night and you're trying to get back to sleep um, it can just switch off your brain long enough that um, you can get that melatonin rocking again and you can nod off to sleep love it thanks so much for sharing that there and it's it's definitely something i need with the busy mind in the middle of the night so I'll, I'll be giving that a go that those kind of slow deep breaths and i guess mm. it's just a case of that 16 seconds start with 16 and try and multiply that over time yeah so you can run two three five ten of those together um i've lots of free guided meditations on my website if you want to try a few different styles i've ones for sleep and relaxation i've ones for um, an anxious or worried mind. I've even got a family meditation in there. Um, so dermotwhelan.com is the place to go and there's free guided meditations there and all the info on my book is up there as well. Excellent. So dermotwhelan.com is the place to go to find out more about the book and, and all those meditations. Absolutely. Brilliant. We'll share that. We should include that in the show notes as well. Listen, Dermot, you've been so kind with your time. Really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brian. Keep up the great work. Hello everyone, Brian here again. A big thank you for listening right to the end of this episode of the Work Well podcast. I want to give a big shout out to our partners, the fruit people who are leading the way in workplace nutrition, both in office and remotely. You can check them out at thefruitpeople.ie. And it's with thanks to the fruit people that we have a delicious fresh fruit and healthy snack pack to give away to one lucky listener for each episode of season three. To find out how to enter, go to workwellpodcast.com and find the link to the latest podcast episode. Finally, are you interested in diving deeper in the area of workplace well-being? Why wouldn't you? You need to check out the Work Well Institute. The WorkWell Institute is an online hub for all your workplace well-being, education, and training needs, whether you're an individual or an organization. Head on over to workwellinstitute.org where you'll find out the details on all the courses available, including my flagship program, 
developing a workplace wellness program that lasts. Check it out at workwellinstitute.org. Thanks again for listening. The original music for this podcast was composed by my friend, Greg Clifford. Thank you, Greg. Remember to work well, stay safe, and I'll see you on the next episode of the Work Well Podcast.